So today we are talking about Take the Land and we're talking about the story of Joshua. Um, this is working okay. I've been having some tech issues today. So we're going to be reading from a few different passages in the scripture. Uh, we're talking all about taking the land and this is from the story of Joshua. Uh, I know it's late so I don't know who's going to be on here live. If you're on here live, please say hello. And if you're on the replay, still say hi and use the hashtag replay and let me know where you are watching from. So um, there's a few different scripture verses. I've listed them off over on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, number one, we're going to be reading from Joshua. We're also going to be reading from Numbers 13. And we're also going to be reading from... Exodus chapter 3. So, hello, hello. Come on in. If you're brand new to me, my name is Susan McVay. I am a married mama of two. I am a business wealth and sales strategist, and I am a kingdom business builder. So, I'm just going to let you know in advance that next week, because uh, I was trying to do it today, but it wasn't cooperating with me. Um, next week, we're going to be doing part two of Esther, Take the Scepter. Uh, there's a whole thing. And on Instagram, I'm going live on my personal page. Same thing with YouTube and Facebook for today. Next Friday, you're going to want to be subscribed to my brand new YouTube channel called Knowing God's Voice, because that's where the teaching is going to be. So I will not be here on Facebook or on Instagram. I will only be doing this over on, actually, I will be doing that on, on Instagram, but I won't be doing it on Facebook. And the one on Instagram is going to be deleted uh, because it's going to be only over on YouTube. So that's next week. Okay. So I, ju I just need to, to let you know um, as per the Lord. So make sure that you're grabbing your Bible and make sure that you've grabbed a notebook, a pen, uh, let us be good scholars and not just the hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. And as with all things, I always recommend that you go and, and take the time, today is late, but make sure that you put in your schedule some time to sit with the word, to sit with what the Lord is showing you, to ask the Holy Spirit how this applies to you, and to ask for more wisdom, more revelation, more application of what to do with these strategies that the Lord is going to show you. Cause this is, this is a strategy book. Like this is a, a rule book as pastor Kevin Ewing likes to say, but this is God's strategy. Like we often ask, I don't know what God wants me to do here. Here's what God wants us to do, right? We just, we just literally have to go and see. So if you're on here, um, say hello and make sure that you can hear me, see me, do all the things. So let's pray. And then we're going to be reading in forward to backward order. So we're going to start in Exodus. We're going to go to Numbers. And then we're going to end in Joshua. Even though this story is, is about Joshua, it's not actually about Joshua. It's about you. So. Father, we just come humbly before you in the name of Jesus to thank you, to thank you for your sacrifice, to thank you for your blood, to thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Mm, thank you, Lord. Today, as we come before you with your word, we just ask for a fresher revelation, a deeper understanding, the wisdom that you, only you can provide to us to reveal the mysteries that are hidden inside of these pages, inside of these very words, that you would make that come alive for us right now in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so in the book of Exodus, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 3. Okay, so in Exodus chapter 3, in verse, I'm going to be reading 
from verse four. And we're gonna see where we get to, okay? And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. In verse six, so we're reading from Exodus three, verse six. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, and a large, unto a large, uh, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now in verse 11, so we're in Exodus 3 and 11. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. So this is God's response in verse 12. And he said, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God in verse 13, behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent, sent me unto you. Hmm, my God. Verse 15, and God said, moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Now, we're going to go over to Numbers 13. Okay, we're going to read the scriptures and then I'm going to share the revelation and what the Lord has showed me. And then obviously we're going to continue to ask the Lord to breathe on his word. Ooh, thank you, Jesus, to breathe on his word, to uh, shed light even further and to, to spread deeper revelation. So in Numbers 13, because the Lord led me to title this, Take the Land, meaning Joshua. Why are we starting with Moses? Because Moses also was supposed to take the land. It's only It only passed to Joshua because Moses didn't finish what he started. So let's go into Numbers 13, right? So we read from Exodus 3, quite a long piece here, from Exodus 3 and 4 until 15. So now we're in Numbers 13. At the start of, of this chapter, it says those sent into Canaan. Now, we're not going to read the first part, but I recommend that you do, that Moses was given a commandment by the Lord to select specific people. So God said, I want you to pick these people, right? These, these sons for e each tribe. So there were 12 spies, one from each tribe that was sent from where they were 
to look inside of Canaan, the land of milk and honey, right? So this is what's happening in Numbers 13. So amongst those that were called were two. Two of them that actually were on God's side. Those two, let's just jog our memories, was Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, oh gosh, I hope I pronounced that right, of the tribe of Judah. Okay? The tribe of Judah is the lion of the tribe of Judah, of which Jesus is the lion for the tribe of Judah. And the tribe of Judah always went first in battle, and it was responsible for worship. There's a, there's a hint there. There's a strategy for us in terms of how God wants us to take the land. Okay, So Caleb came from the tribe of Judah. Then we have Joshua, who actually is listed. There's a clarification on his name. Because Joshua is called Oshea, or Oshea, the son of Nun. 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 I'm going to call it Nun from the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim is the tribe, uh, the tribe of Ephraim is one of Joseph's son. So last time I was on here, I said, Joseph got a double portion. When he got an inheritance from his father, Joseph wasn't actually named. He got his sons Manasseh and Ephraim, they each got a portion. So Joseph ended up getting two portions out of the inheritance from Israel, okay? So the two spies who actually gave a good report, one was the tribe of Judah, Caleb. The second one was Joshua, and he came from the tribe Ephraim, which is a son of, of Joseph, okay? So if we look in Numbers, it says here, the spies give an unfavorable report. So we're going to start reading from um, Numbers 13 and 26. Okay. And they went and came to Moses. Now remember, these spies were chosen by the Lord. Okay. So, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran and to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land though, through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Now, in chapter 14, it says the people murmur at the news. Now, I want you to imagine they've already left Egypt, right? Like, And remember how they left. They left after a lot of negotiation shall we say, a lot of back and forthing, right? Where there was a lot of contention. They were told they could go and then Pharaoh changed his mind. And he was like, no, you can't go. Well, maybe you should go. No, you can't go. And so each time there was these plagues, 
the locusts, the uh, water turned into blood, right? They killed the firstborn child, um, firstborn son for every family. And then finally, Pharaoh said, be gone with you. And they actually were given jewels, gold. Like they, they were paid to leave. They were paid to go. Go, go, go. So that's how they left. So God did all of that for the children of Israel. And yet when they got into the wilderness, right? And they already knew where they were going because God told them where they were going. So just because you know where you're going doesn't mean that you are ready to actually take it. Does this make sense? And for these people, we can see very clearly, even though they had left, they hadn't actually left. So I want you to remember when Lot and his family were saved because of Abraham, right? Abraham intervened and said, is there, you know, is there not at least one that you would save, Lord? But he kept, he kept negotiating because he knew that Sodom and Gomorrah were going to be destroyed. And he knew that his nephew were, were there with his family and he wanted them saved. So he negotiated on his behalf. And because of his faithfulness, the Lord said, yes, I, I will save Lot. So he sent angels to go in and save him. But the angels were very clear by giving the instruction of the Lord and said, if you look back, you will die. And that's what happened to Lot's wife. But that looking back spoke to her heart, right? It spoke to where she actually was still dwelling. She was dwelling in the past, which is why she looked back. So the children of Israel, just because they left, didn't mean that's where they lived. That's not where they dwelled. They kept looking back. And so when we look here, right, they saw themselves not as God saw them. They, they forgot that they were children of God, right? So instead of seeing themselves as children of God, like I want you to compare because who else do we, do we know fought giants? Well, maybe David. David had an opposite reaction because as soon as he understood, I, I have been appointed by God. Like I know what it is to know who God is. And because of that, I am firm in my identity as God's chosen one, as God's child. And because of that, I, I can see this giant and he literally was a giant, right? Uh, Goliath was a giant. So I can look at this big giant, fellow who is older than me, I'm a child. And because I know that God is fighting this battle and I just happen to be here on earth, that it doesn't matter what he looks like because God's already done it for me. So that is what it's like when you operate from a place of authority and kingdom power and kingdom identity, the identity of Christ. So these children forgot who they were and that's why they were allowed or they allowed this evil report to start rumbling through. Now remember the only one that had the faith to believe and to remember what God said, Caleb, Caleb, Caleb was the first to speak. It says right here, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. Caleb remembered what God did for them. The rest of them said, they're stronger than we are. Excuse me? Do you forget, do you forget what God already did in order to get you out of there in the first place? Right? So they spoke out what they saw. What they what they what they saw with their natural eyes, not what they perceived by the spirit, not what they discerned, and certainly not what God said. So, in chapter fourteen of Numbers fourteen, when it says the people murmur at the news, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Why? 
because they believed what these dudes said instead of remembering what God did. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron because now they're thinking, what have you done? You have taken us from where we were. We were clothed, we were fed, we had shelter, we knew what we were doing, it wasn't great, we were slaves, but here we are and we're gonna be killed by these giants. Going to a place where we don't even know if we're supposed to be there or not, because they forgot. And so they were very upset. Now it says here in the Bible, and the whole congregation said unto them, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? Now nowhere in the Bible did it say that God had said either of these, right? In fact, God kept saying, go and possess the land. Go and possess the land. Like, this is your land of milk and honey. It doesn't matter who's there already. This is the land that God has already set aside. This was literally an inheritance that had been promised way back generations ago through Abraham. Through Abraham. Now, remember, Abraham is the father of faith. He didn't even have his kid until he was 100 years old. That was Isaac. Abraham was told to kill Isaac and he was willing to do that, but he didn't have to. And then Isaac then had Jacob. Well, Jacob had broke his hip wrestling an angel because Jacob was a bad man. And as he was, he would never have uh, received his inheritance. He had to be changed. And in that transformation, right, in, in having everything opened up to him, he became a different person. His physical form was crippled. Does this sound familiar? When we are called to die to our flesh. So his, he had to fight against his flesh because his flesh as it was, wasn't going to allow him to possess his land, to possess his inheritance, to take what God had promised him. So the, an angel literally had to wrestle with him and broke his hip. And so, in doing so, Jacob then turned into Israel. Well, here we are. Israel then begat all of these tribes, which then, they were, they were a land that had no land, <laughs> so to speak, right? So imagine, this is now generations down the line where God has made this promise. And in order for this promise to be fulfilled, there has to be some brave soul that's willing to take the land the way that God has declared it to be done uh, and to do it with faith, right? To do it with faith. This literally is, is a book of faith, right? Like this is the, dish, the, the dictionary definition. This is the Bible of faith. So when Caleb says, let's go, now they were outnumbered, right? At this point, Joshua didn't even say anything. It was just Caleb. And so at this point, when they go, let's go, he has all of these other spies that have gone into the land and said, yeah, you're right, but no, 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 we can't do this. No. So I want you to think. What are all those excuses, right? Think about, because they were all related. This, this was his family. They were the 12 tribes of Israel. These were all siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles. Where are your family members operating with an evil report against your territory? against your promises, against where you need to go and have faith to be able to take what is yours, what God has already promised you, what he set aside as your inheritance. Because just because it doesn't look like it's going to be done or just because somebody speaks about it not to be done doesn't mean that God's promises are null and void. In fact, it means that it's going to sit there until somebody is brave enough, bold enough, just like God kept saying to Joshua, which we'll get to in a minute, be bold, be of good courage, because the land is still there for yours to take. You have to actually go and take it. 
it's not enough to have left the old behind, right? That's all Exodus is all about. It's literally moving you from the old into the new, but there's that messy middle where there's a, a portion where you're neither in the old, but you're not in the new yet, not the new, new. You're in a new middle, but you're not in the final destination. You're still in transition. Ooh, who is this for? And so when we're in that, that point, God is still looking out for his children. God is still in a, a place and a, a position of power, authority. He gave them unlimited provision. Like that is the blessing of the Lord. That is the favor of God. And for them to think God is not with us here. God is going to allow these giants to kill us like grasshoppers. Like this is insane. But how many of us, I've been there too. How many of us look at the things that we are called to do? Your assignment, your appointments, your uh, things that God has said, now this is for you. And you look at it and it's like this big, massive boulder, like a giant mountain or just this huge thing that you can't fathom doing, right? And then are you complaining? Are you murmuring? Are you the one speaking the evil report? Are you allowing the other people who have come in to spy, right, to look at what are you doing? What's going on? How is that thing going? Right? Ooh, have you have you launched yet? What about that book? Oh, you booked any speaking gigs? How many clients do you have? Like when people start asking these questions, right? Who sent them? And why are you telling them these things when they have no business knowing? I don't know who that was for. So in verse 3 of Numbers 14, it says, And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey, were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. So rent means like they, they were like, they were so upset, they were like ripping at their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we passed through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only, only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. My God. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Do you, do you just hear what I just said? So they were saying good stuff. And everybody else, they wanted to, to stone them to death. They wanted to pick up the stones and throw them at Joshua and Caleb for what they said. Now, Joshua and Caleb said good things. Joshua and Caleb said, the things that God already had said about this land. And yet somehow they were so upset because they believed the evil report that they couldn't hear clearly. They couldn't see clearly. They were so upset. It reminds me of later on in scripture where it says, these are the days where we will call good wicked and, and wicked good, right? This is what happened back in Numbers 14. These people, the children of Israel, were calling the good report evil and the evil report they called good. What's going on? So in verse 10, it continues, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me and how long 
will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. And Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of, of a cloud, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if Thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swore unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. And by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Mm, my God. Jesus, Jesus. Okay. Pardon, I beseech thee the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these 10 times, and meaning the 10 people who said bad things, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swore unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherewith he went, and his seed shall possess it. My God. So I'm not going to finish reading this piece here. I want you to go and, and read it. And I want you to read all of Numbers 14. What There's two pieces that I want to highlight. Okay. And the reason why I paused, because I was getting a revelation. Number one, in Numbers 14 and 18, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy forgiving iniquity and transgression and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. That means that when we sin, when we have iniquities in our bloodline, you may not see it visit you or your children. That's the first and the second generation. You may see it visiting the third and the fourth generation. And that means some of the things that you may be encountering in your own life that you're like, what is going on? Where did this come from? I want you to go backwards through your family line because according to Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation it means that what is that your great great it could be your great great grandfather grandparents your great 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 grandparents something that they have done has opened up the doorway for this iniquity to be visited upon you and it we already know the wages of sin are death. And so that could mean, and I, I don't mean like a physical death, although that, that could be part of it, right? Uh, some, some of us have uh, family members that have passed away early, right? Before their old age. Some, their early deaths, there are infirmities or diseases. There are spiritual deaths. There are literal deaths. There are figurative deaths, meaning like what has died in your life? 
It, are there dreams that have died? Are there relationships that have that have died? Are there financial opportunities that have died? Right? Like the wages of sin are death. What has died in your life that you're not sure what the source was? I want you right now, because this is for somebody, I want you to go right now and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what is an iniquity that has been visited upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. What has happened in three or four generations past that you need to close the door on, that you need to repent for. Some of these sins need to be repented for specifically so that you do not have any legal rights against you by the accuser, by the enemy, okay? The second piece of this is that there was a consequence to these actions that the Lord was so aggravated, right? He says here, how long, in verse 27, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have speak, spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Goodness. Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swore unto you to make you dwell therein, save Caleb and Joshua. Hmm. But your little ones, which he said shall be a, a prey, them will I bring, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. Because he knew the importance. So the Lord basically is, is showing us that there was a spirit, right? Because that's why he said, but Caleb, but my servant Caleb in verse 24, because he had another spirit with him. So that tells us that the evil report was caused by a spirit because the Lord said Caleb had another spirit, likely the spirit of the Lord, but this is a lowercase s. So he had another spirit, right? This spirit allowed Caleb to follow the Lord fully. And because of it, not only would Caleb get to go into this land, but his seed, his children, would be able to possess the land. Because he was brave and bold enough to remember God's promises and to, to be on God's side. Even in the face of his, these were family, right? These were all the children of Israel. So he had to stand up for what he believed God said to him, which he knew God said to all of them, right? And to believe God, even though it didn't make sense to do so, even though his natural eyes wanted to fight against him and say, no, look at how big these guys are. The, the people that they were talking about were from the land, uh, they were called Anak, A-N-A-K. Anak means long necked. So while we don't know exactly how big they were, the... Uh, the reference point is that they were they were unusually long necked. They were long limbed, and so they were seen as giants. There is a theory that Goliath may have been uh, related somehow to this race of people. Okay, so and we know how big Goliath was. So that just gives you a rough idea of like imagine you're peering over, you're going into this land, you can see everything that God told you was there. But God never said anything about these big people, right? So they're allowing their worst nightmares to come to pass in their own minds. Those are their, their soulish fears. So instead of remembering what God said, they decided to say something that God never told them natural by operating from their natural instincts, from their, their natural senses. It grieved the Lord so much that he actually didn't allow them to go any further because he knew that that spirit of fear would infect all of the children and it would, it would actually prevent them from being able to move anywhere where they needed to go, let alone the promised land. Now, the rest of this, chapter in Numbers uh, 14, it says the men who brought the unfavorable report die by a plague. That was the Lord. Okay. Now, 
thankfully we have grace. Thankfully, God is merciful. Thankfully, we can use the blood of Jesus. But when people say, well, you know, God, God doesn't do bad things. Well, yes and no. Like, we don't have to fear death, but there's consequences to our actions, just like any parent and child relationship. The reality is, though, God said there is a promise and you still get to take the promise, but not everybody is going to take hold of it equally. I will allow those children to come in, but not the people who are above, right? So why is this important? Well, let's get into, where is it? Joshua, 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 Joshua. Hold on. So I want us to go into Joshua now, okay? Because that that's really, well, that's really why we're here. But we needed to paint the picture. Um, because, of course, the only one that I didn't mark. <laughs> oh, I'm going to go to my index. I, because it's important for us to understand how they got there, right? How they got there. Because by the time we get to the, the point where now Joshua, right? Because even Moses, Moses was not allowed. He got to Pisgah, which was a point where he could see across. But the Lord told him, because you let all of these people complain and, and you did not intervene, you were the leader and you did not use your power and the authority that I gave you. Because remember, when the Lord, and we're going to tie these two together, in Exodus, in Exodus 3, when the Lord told Moses, you're going to be the one that takes them out from Egypt to my promised land, Moses asked a very important question, which Sounds like a question that a lot of us ask of ourselves, or we ask the Lord, who am I to do this? Who am I to do this? Well, that's called imposter syndrome, right? Who am I to do this? Well, if you think about yourself, then you're just you, and it's still good. But when you are a child of God, when you have been appointed and anointed by the Lord, it's not just you. Let me prove it, because he said in verse uh, 11, Exodus 3 and 11, and Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Well, how did God answer? In verse 12, God says, and he said, certainly I, meaning God, will be with thee meaning you, Moses, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. So how did God respond when Moses asked, who am I to do this? God responded by saying, I am with you. Well, if you know Jesus, don't you have God with you? Now, back in those days, it was unusual because God did not dwell with them, right? That, that's why this, this was unusual uh, because unless you were a priest and God would come down to the tabernacle in the holiest of holies, then there was only select people that God would come and talk to, okay? And that's often why the kings would be like, what did God say? What did God say? Now, gratefully, because the veil was ripped when Jesus died, that separation of God and humanity, which includes you as a child of God, we are one in the same presence, meaning we carry the manifest glory of the Lord within us, right? And that means that when Moses asked, who am I to do this, right? When you say, Lord, who am I to do this? 
Who am I to take this land? Who am I to take this territory? Who am I to be a speaker? Who am I to be a world-class author? Who am I to be a trainer? Who am I to be a business consultant? Who am I to be the world's leading therapist? Like whatever it is, who am I to be a, a parent, a mother, a father, a grandparent, right? Who am I to be a chef, to be a personal trainer? to be a counselor to the stars. I don't know what your title is. Whatever it is that God has said you are, whoever that is, whoever God has created you to be, you may be questioning, who am I to do this? Moses was fulfilling his God-given assignment and purpose. And yet, he was looking at himself as Moses, as Moses the you know the the hebrew boy who was sent down a river and raised by the pharaoh's daughter that's how he saw himself so this is important because we're going to get into joshua because in the book of joshua we're going to read from joshua 1 uh let's go we're going to start from joshua 1 and 1 it says, the Lord appoints Joshua to succeed Moses. Now, remember, Joshua and Caleb were the only two uh, spies that actually gave a good report. And it was Caleb who first spoke up, which makes sense because he's from the, the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah always goes first. The tribe of Judah is the one that worships, that worships the Lord. Okay. So uh, Joshua comes from the tribe of Ephraim which is one of Joseph's sons. So Joshua, in verse one, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass, and that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, which is the river, Thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast." There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses. So I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. That's Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Now, if you were paying attention, I want you to recall how many times because this was a conversation that God had with Joshua after Moses died. And he basically said, the torch passes to you. And now you're going to be responsible for finishing what I told Moses is already going to be done. Right? And so every place that the sole of your feet shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. So what I told Moses is now being passed on to you. So in nine verses, how many times do, does God say, does God say, be strong, be of good courage, 
how many times in nine verses because i just read it all out right and actually from verse six to nine be strong and of a good courage for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Right? This book of the law shall, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that it is written therein. For then, because this is conditional, right? Because the Lord is giving a strategy. He's saying, number one, be strong. Be very courageous. Now, anytime the Bible, because it's not like today's English, anytime that the Bible uses words in duplicate, anytime that something is repeated, we have to pay attention, right? Anytime that there is a word like very or more, it's not like today. We kind of throw these words around as if it's like, oh, that's like amazing, or they don't do that. When they use these extra words, it means extra, extra, right? Like exceedingly abundantly. Like when it says more, more abundantly, I talked about this last week, it means exceedingly abundantly more, not just more, <laughs> exceedingly abundantly so when we see good courage it means like really 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 even the very courageous so in verse six in verse seven and in verse nine the lord says the same thing over and over and over again why why right good night monique nice to see you it's been a little bit you said that you were starting Joshua today. I actually had a different uh, scripture that I needed to share. So, and I had shared this at the very beginning. I'm going to be doing a part two to Esther, the book of Esther, take the scepter, but I needed to do it on a brand new channel. Uh, I won't, I will be doing it live here on my personal Instagram. I have to verify with the Lord, but it won't stay up because it's going to be on my brand new YouTube channel called Knowing God's Voice. So you're going to want to go and look for that, subscribe to that, because that's where every Friday's kind of Bible teachings are going to be housed. And they're all only going to be on YouTube, because that's what God said. So uh, that was the plan. The streaming software that I use Uh wouldn't allow me to go live because I guess I hadn't enabled it and I didn't realize this, even though I prepped all of it yesterday. I just didn't know that that was a thing. I Well, I shouldn't say that. I forgot because it's been such a long time since I've um, been going live on my main YouTube channel. So, but this morning, we're tracking because this morning, this came up while I was praying. And th this is the revelation that I got. And so I said, okay, Lord, I can't do this other one. What do you, and I was li just literally sitting here an hour ago and I said, I need it. I, uh, what do you want me to share? And he said, well, I, I already gave you something this morning. Is that not good enough? And I said, okay. Uh, Monique, the name of the YouTube channel is Knowing God's Voice. Knowing God's Voice. Um, I will put up a post on my personal Instagram. I'll do a, a little video on there that, that will stay up, but knowing God's voice, um, you might see it if you uh, go to my personal channel and you might see it under like related channels. I'm not quite sure how it shows up for everybody else. So earlier at the beginning of our teaching tonight, what I shared was we went we went through a journey. We first started in Exodus, Exodus 3, which we just revisited because Moses, Moses didn't feel equipped, right? Like he said, who am I, who am I to do this, Lord? And the Lord answered by telling him, I'm with you. 
right? So, so what that tells me and what that should tell all of us is that when we ask who we are, we have to remember that we are created in the image of our father. You're, you're created in the image of God. So if we look at ourselves as we are, we will never see who God created us to be. Think about Moses. Moses didn't see himself as God saw him. He didn't see himself as a leader. In fact, he saw himself as a killer, right? He, he killed a man and ran away. Gideon, mighty man of valor. That's how God saw him. He saw himself as a coward hiding in the granary, hoping everybody would go away, right? When the army numbers dwindled that Gideon had to fight with, he was very concerned. So I want us to think Esther, which will be the teaching next week, right, for part two. Esther was an orphan. She didn't, she didn't see herself as a queen. That's why when Mordecai said, do you not think that they're going to come after you? Because she, she was a Jew, right? Under a royal decree to die. So if we don't ask God, who am I in you, Lord? Right? Because it's not about our earthly identity. It's about who did you create me to be, Lord? Because there is a land for each of us. There is a land of milk and honey for each of us. And a lot of us, we're going to the same place, right? We're all doing this fight for the kingdom of heaven. We're doing this for the kingdom of God. We have the ability to do this here on earth and to eat the good of the land, not just when we die, right? But here on earth. So, in order for us to do that, though, we have to be aligned to our kingdom assignment. And so we have to know who God created us to be. We have to know who God is in us. We have to understand through the mind of Christ. And that's why Joshua is told, meditate on this day and night so that you can observe them according to all that is written therein. For then... Thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So when we try to do something on our own will or on our own accord, according to the thoughts and the workings of the world, then we are outside of God's plans and purpose. According to Jeremiah 29, 11, God's plans and purpose are always for us to do what? For good, to prosper, not for evil. So if we don't follow the condition of his word, right? Then we're going to face difficulties. We're going to be like the children of Israel who looking at the promised land said, wait, yeah, there's fruit. It looks good, but wait, we're so small. We're little grasshoppers. They're big, giant people. There, there's no way that we can fight because that's what happened. Right? So we can see there's a pattern. There's a pattern of behavior. There's a pattern of thought. Because, oh, thank you, Jesus. Because Moses said, who am I to do this, Lord? Yeah. And he had God right there with him. Because God was the one talking to him. God did not talk to all of the children all the time. But he did to Moses. And he did to Aaron. And so when God came in and said, I'm going to answer you. But, but I'm going to tell you who I am. Right, because later on in Exodus three is where we get the the grand I am that I am. Well, that's why God says when we attach I am to I am, right? Like, so don't try to make sense of this with your natural mind. When we declare things, that I am, our affirmations, our declarations, and we say things that are evil. They are very powerful because God is called I am. That is the name that God gave to Moses. It's the first time that God asked to be called a name. I am that I am, right? And so why did God, out of all the names of the Bible, why did God pick I am? Because I am represents who we are. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh my God. Wow. That blessed me. What's that? 
So of course it makes sense that when when Moses asked, who am I to do this, Lord? That God answered him by showing him who God was, who God is, right? God may answer you when you say, who am I? Don't be surprised if God shows you who he is for you. Hmm, that was for someone right now, right? When God shows you that he is a gracious God, when God shows you that he is a gracious father, and he's saying, you are a parent, right? You are a mother, you are a father. And you're like, huh, right? Because God is gonna show you how he parents. Because you are a reflection of your, of your father. You, we have God in us, right? That's why Jesus died, so that we have no separation. We are the tabernacle, we are the temple. We are the holiest of holies. So what does that mean? The holiest of holies is the way that the temple was designed. It is the head. This, this is your temple. The holiest of holies is your, is, your, is your mind, your head, right? Because if you were to lay out the design of God's temple, it looks like a, a, a kind of like a expanded stick figure. The holiest of holies is at the, at the top of the temple. And only the priests could go in. That's why every time it says, like, when Moses would come onto holy land, the only he would have to take off his shoes. The priests could only get into the holiest of holies. Not everybody could come in. And they weren't able to look upon the, the tabernacle because the glory of the Lord was so weighty that if you looked upon it, you would die. Like, the, the manifest power of God. So I want you to think that power that could kill a man, but also raise a man from the dead, lives in you. Lives in you. That is how God sees you. That is why he can say, take the land, possess and occupy, be of good courage, be strong. And that's why he was so upset with the ten that gave the evil report. We went from Exodus 3, talking about Moses, right? Then we went to Numbers 13, 14, because in there, they had a chance to cross, to take the land, but they didn't, because they decided to believe the words of man, the words of the 10 spies that gave an evil report. And God was so aggrieved that he, there was a plague that killed the 10. And he, and he said this was going to happen. He said, they're not going to be able to come in. I'll take their kids in. I'll take their kids in, but I won't take them. So wiping them out. Because they saw themselves a certain way. And in there we saw, right, in Numbers 13, I highlighted a revelation where the Lord said that I am, I am good, I'm merciful, but the iniquities will be visited upon the third and fourth generations. And I had, I had shared for, for someone on here, whether you're watching live or on the replay, some of you have been wondering, why can't I possess? Why can't I take? Why can't I receive? Why is the promise so far away? Like, I know that this is something that my parents have tried, my grandparents have tried, I'm trying, it can't be broken, why? And I'm, I'm telling you right now, we're going to go back because, oh, Jesus, oh my God. In Numbers 14 and 18, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. The Holy Spirit is going to give you revelation right now about the iniquities that have been visited upon you as the child from the iniquities of the father, third and fourth generation down. Does it make sense? That's a bloodline issue. That's a generational issue. That is 
like the Lord is showing us. If you're, if you know that the promise has been long suffering, like meaning people have been talking about this for years and it's like, you almost get there. You almost get there. You almost get there, but then you can't. That's an iniquity. That's a generational sin. That's, a, that's something in your bloodline that keeps following through. And the Lord is showing us right here, right? And he, that's why he killed off the ones that complained because he knew that there would be a consequence of that sin visiting the third and fourth generation down. That's what the word says. Does this make sense? Are you tracking with me? So remember, both of these, this was, this was a habit. This was something that was in the bloodline of the children of Israel. Remember, their identity, not in Christ, not in God, was slavery. They were, they identified as slaves. They actually said to Moses, we should never have come here. They actually appointed a captain. That's what Numbers 13 says, right? They appointed a captain to take them back. They were like, this is terrible. We can see that place where little grasshoppers, we won't beat them. We should just go back. Have you ever thought that? Have you ever thought, oh, I should never have done this. I should never have quit that job. I should never have started this business. I should never have started this ministry. I should never have moved. I should never have left that, you know, that, that old place. I should never have gone here. I should never have let that person go. I should never have quit. I should go back. Who am I talking to? I've been there. I've been there lots of times where I think, oh my gosh, have I made a mistake? Oh my gosh, have I made a mistake? Did I hear God right? Yes, you did. Remember, the word says that if you are a sheep, if you are God's sheep, then you hear your father's voice clearly and you and the voice of a stranger you do, you do not know. Stop thinking that you know the voice of a stranger. You don't know the voice of a stranger. Resist that lie. I rebuke you, devil, right? If you follow God's word, and if you don't know what God says, then you need to read his word. Because when you read his word, you start to understand his voice. You understand his vocal patterns. It's just like when you come on here, if you haven't heard me for a while, some of the things that I say to you might sound unfamiliar. But if you've heard me every single week, or if you've been listening to me for a while, then you're familiar with how I talk, right? If you listen to the Holy Spirit, even though you may be listening to different people right now, a lot of us are saying very, very similar messages. Why? Because we're not speaking on our own accord. We're speaking on behalf of the Lord, right? And that comes through the spirit of God, the same creation, um, the, the, the same spirit of creation that actually was present at the beginning of time, the same spirit of God that lives in you. That is what the, the Lord Jesus died for all of us to have. That's part of our promise. That's part of how we take the land. We don't take it on our own, on our own might. The word literally says, not, not by my might, not by my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So we do this according to God's power and might through his spirit, the spirit of life, the spirit of truth, the spirit of revelation, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of creation. That spirit. Does this make sense? Some of you, some of us, we have been separated. Because remember, Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that survived out of the, the 12 spies. So there were 10 spies. They were all cousins. They were all cousins. Like, now, if you're part of Tiffany Montgomery's community, you're like, hey, cousin, hey, cousin, hey, cuz, right? But, I mean, have you been part of a family where you don't always get along with your family? There's that set of cousins where you're like, don't talk to them. You don't want to sit next to them at the barbecue because they might be asking all kinds of crazy stuff, right? 
Joshua and Caleb were essentially alone. That separation, the separation that happened through the wilderness was not just a physical wandering. It was a complete mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical experience because the Lord realized, I have to work out this whole mentality, this identity that does not belong to them. They see themselves as slaves. And until that is gone, right? There was a whole generation. They wandered for 40 years. That's a whole generation of people. So by the time they came around it again, they didn't remember what happened the first time. They didn't remember that first go around when that evil report came through. That was intentional. It had to be worked out of their system. That's why every day the Lord says to us, we need to take up our cross daily. We need to die to our flesh daily. Because if we don't, then we are forced to wander for 40 years in the wilderness because we have to be like, it has to be removed out of us in order for us to be able to take the land. The promised land is always available for you. And here's what I want you to understand, because it's like the story, the story that I'm going to share is I had a client, um, my fir very first online client. Okay. Huh. Okay. I don't know what, who this is for. So the Lord has asked me to share this. Um, when I first started in the online space, we all started zero. I had no I had no background or knowledge or experience in online business. I had lots of business experience, lots of sales experience, but truthfully, the first person who hired me, uh, she wanted sales, but that wasn't her main problem. Funny enough, like she wanted to learn how to write, how to communicate, social media. Uh, I literally had my Facebook account for like, three months before she hired me. Okay. So was I an expert in what she had asked at the time? I felt like Moses, who am I to do this? And when she asked me, do you have any clients? I said, no, I don't. Now I, I had another client who, uh, didn't want to tell people that she didn't have any clients online. It didn't work out very well for her. I told her not to do that. I said, you want to be honest because you'll get found out. And she did. Somebody asked, can I have a reference? And she's like, what do I do? And I said, I don't know. I mean, you kind of, you kind of got yourself into this. Like you, you're going to have to figure this out because I told you not to lie. But this client who had come to me um, and asked, do you have any clients? And I said, no, but I know I can help you. I know I can help you. I'm not here to convince you. You're going to have to decide for yourself, right? I've done other things that are related, but they're not, they're not exactly what you're asking me to do here. But I know that I can help you. And so she went away, thought about it and came back and said, okay, I'm in. I was nearly as surprised as she was, to be honest just both fell off my chair <laughs> when she said it. Um, but when we started working together, she shared a story about how her and her husband found each other. They had been going to the same meeting for five years, five years in the same room, each of them looking for a partner. So he was looking for a wife and she was looking for a husband. And for five years, every single week, they were at the same meeting space, never saw each other once. They were hidden under plain sight, each of them, like two ships passing in the night, until one day they were both ready to take this land of marriage with each other. And it was like their eyes were opened and they suddenly saw each other from across the room. And it was like a moment of recognition where they realized, huh, you. And same thing, like her for him and him for her. And things move very fast, right? When 
you are ready to do what God has asked you to do, there may be a process that's required in order to prepare you. Sometimes it requires you to get rid of, of all of the stuff, including like, like with Lot's wife and Lot's, um, Lot and his family, they had to be moved because they were in a wicked place. They were in Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like one of the wickedest places ever. That's why God tore it down. Some of you have been in a very wicked place and you have been moved out, right? Don't look back, just like the children of Israel. They were moved from Egypt where they were slaves. And some of them wanted to go back because they thought it was better than the uncertainty of having to follow on faith, right? We talk about, I believe, I, you know, I walk by sight, I'm moved by the spirit. But when it really comes down to it, it's hard to, to live that lifestyle. Like, it, 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 I'm challenged every day, every minute of every day. And anybody that tells you that it's a, a walk in the park is lying. It's lying. We do it by the skin of our teeth, meaning the consequence of not doing it is far greater AKA, thankfully, God's not going to strike us down with lightning or plague, right? He's a merciful God. And because of Jesus, we have the, the blood. But it doesn't mean that the enemy then doesn't have an opportunity to attack because when we are disobedient, we are operating out of the Antichrist spirit because we're going against Christ. We are going against God. It's a spirit of rebellion, but it is an Antichrist spirit, right? And sometimes we think, that bad you no know, it is it is and if you don't believe me go and read Saul with Samuel uh in first uh is it first Samuel 13 8 it's either first Samuel or second Samuel 13 8 where Samuel tells Saul wait for seven days and Saul waits for seven days but on the seventh day he's like I don't know if he's coming. Let me do the altar. And when Samuel comes back and he goes, what have you done? He's like, well, I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited. Wait, 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 wait. And then I didn't think you're coming. So I did the altar. And Samuel is like, if you had waited, then you would be blessed. But because you didn't and you disobeyed, bad things are going to happen. And they did. He lost his land because of the word of the Lord. He did all of it right, except for the last little bit. And that last little bit was still disobedience. And many of us have fallen into this trap where we think God is not going to do it. It's not going to happen. It's not going to show up. I can't get the land. This looks impossible. That's what it means to walk by faith, right? So Joshua here, in chapter 1, from verse 6 to 9, specifically, God says three times, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and very courageous. Have I not commanded thee? Right? He reminds him and says, look, in case you don't forget, in case you don't remember, I'm going to make sure that you remember. I'm commanding you. I've said this out of my mouth. This is what you must do. Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee with whithersoever thou goest. This is exactly the same thing that the Lord said when Moses asked, who am I to do this? In Exodus 3. Come with me, lest you forget. He says here, who am I to do this? Right? That's in verse Exodus 3 and 11. God answered, and he said in verse 12, certainly I will be with thee. Come back to Joshua 1 and 9. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest.
we already know that because of Jesus, God is with us wherever we go. The word says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you, right? I will never leave you, never, never leave you. I will never forsake you. So I want you to think, God, why did you have to say this three times to Joshua? Why? Because we're going somewhere here. Because remember, Moses, who am I? The children of Israel, we're too small. We can't do this. So then in Joshua, what did God need them to make sure of? Why did God say this three times? Because God needed Joshua to remember. And in case he didn't know, he needed to see Joshua. <coughs> Hold on. He's like, God needed Joshua to know who he was in God. He needed Joshua to know who his identity was. He was strong and courageous. Because if we go back to Numbers 13 and 14, Caleb and Joshua were the only two that gave the good report. Joshua was the one that told them, like, no, we, 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 we should be going in. Let's look. Oh, I'm not the news, but my servant. Okay. Where is it, Lord? Oh, I can't find it. Oh, here. Numbers six and seven. Let's read from Numbers 14 and 6. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land. So meaning they actually were the spies that went into the land, right? So they just weren't bystanders there. They rent their clothes, meaning like they started ripping their clothes. They were, they were so upset. They were like, oh, my God, I can't, I can't believe you guys, right? And they spake unto the, all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we passed through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, which the word says, when we delight in the Lord, he delights in us, right? So we have to delight in the Lord, and he delights in us. So if, if he doesn't delight in us, are we delighting in in him first. Verse 8 continues, then he will bring us into this land. Right? So if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So this tells me the revelation is if this happens, then that happens, right? That he will give us this land. The 40 years that that happened, the Lord was not delighted. The Lord was not delighted because otherwise he would have brought them into the land. A land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. For they are bred for us, their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So the Lord is literally just reminding Joshua. Hey, buddy, this is what you said. <laughs> Remember who you are? You, dude, that stood before those people that wanted to stone you to death because you said what I told you to say? That's who you are. That's who I need you to remember you are. So in the book of Joshua, the Lord kept saying, be strong and of good courage because that's who Joshua 
That's his identity in God. He already demonstrated this when he stood up to the masses and spoke for the Lord. Him and Joshua, like Caleb and Joshua were on God's side. Caleb was the first one because the tribe of Judah goes first. They are the worshipers. So he worshiped the Lord through his words in saying, no, this is good land. Let's go. Let's take it. We can do this. And then later on, when Joshua and Caleb stood up together and said, listen, we went there. We saw, right? We were there. We saw this. Don't believe them. Like, oh my God, we're so frustrated. Why aren't you listening? And he said, do not fear. So Joshua was, was the one that was telling everybody else, don't be afraid. We can do this. Remember what God said. God delights in us. So God is going to give us this land. Like he believed it. So when we get to the book of Joshua, 40 years later, mind you, right? Because I want you to remember, they have been wandering for 40 years. So at this point, Joshua would have been like, are we ever going to get there, Lord? Like, I know that you told me, but this is an awfully long time. We just keep making around the mountain and going and going and going. I mean, it's right there. But will we get there? Because I already did this once before. Right? Because nobody else remembers the first time. The rest of them died. The evil reporters were killed. So over 40 years, it, it's been worked out of them. That generational iniquity, the Lord allowed to die off in his mercy. So in Joshua, the book of Joshua, it is now the torch and the baton is passed to Joshua from Moses to Joshua. So in here, the Lord is reminding Joshua, dude, I need you to remember, you were the one that believed me before. Will you believe me again? Because I am with you. And if you're willing to do this, then let's go. Does this make sense? Monique says it was a long time. I know. Like, and I will say, because a lot of people say, well, it's too late. It's never too late. Look at Joshua. It literally is never too late. I didn't start my online business until after I turned 40. It was the year, I think I turned 40 or 40, no, 42 maybe. So, and I, I know people who have started their business, second, third businesses at like 50, 60, 70, even 80. Age and time don't exist with God. That's why Abraham and Sarah had a baby at 100 and they, they laughed at the Lord. They were like, <laughs> surely I won't have a baby now. But God's promise does not pass void, right? He will not make a promise that will not come to pass. I am that I am. That's who he is, right? That's why when we say all of God's promises are yes and amen, amen means so be it. It means like so be it is it's done. I want you to think like, what does that, what do those words actually mean? When you say, so be it, it's not, it's about to happen. It's, it's done. Like, so be it, it's done. Does this make sense? So where do you need to be reminded of your identity in the word? And here's the thing through these three pieces of this one story, right? Because it's a, it's a journey. Where are you allowing yourself to see? I know. How do I say? Holy Spirit helping. How are you not allowing yourself to see what God sees? Meaning, what is your identity in Christ? How are you a reflection of the Lord? 
because you are created in his image. Do you see your natural self or are you seeing your God self, meaning the, the self that God created you to be? Because the, the person that God created you to be is the one that you need to be in order to take the land. Joshua needed to be the Joshua from the good report. That's what the Lord was reminding him. It does not matter how long it's taken. It does not matter what life has done for you or to you. I want you to remember in this season, because you are right there. This is, this is the threshold, right? This is the tipping point that between now, like we're, we're in an open door opportunity. Now, this is the year of doors. The doors that will open will depend on your faith. But I'm telling you right now that the devil is also opening doors and those doors you do not want opened. They are the ones that are opened by evil reports. And depending on which way the wind blows, meaning are you following the voice of the Lord or are you believing in something that's bigger than what you what you see in front of you, right? So if you allow the enemy, which is, ha is what happened to the children of Israel so that they kept wandering, they failed to believe the Lord. They thought they were on God's side, but their words and their actions showed otherwise. And because of it, they perished. Do not let that be you. The world is going to look very, very, very uncertain. It's, it's already shifted. And for those of you that like catch me by the spirit, right? Like I want you to discern what I'm saying because it's going to be a little bit cryptic because I have to be sensitive to what we're saying out loud in public. The world is going to look a certain way. The spirit is going to look like, like milk and honey. And if you do not follow the, the leaning of the, the one who created everything in the world, you are going to be led astray because there are wolves in sheep clothing. There are people on the pulpit who have no business leading because they have forgotten the presence of the Lord. And they are choosing to platform instead of to be still. Hmm. I didn't know that was going to come. Thank you, Lord. You need to trust your discernment. There are lots of corrections that are happening as we speak. I've been talking about this for over two years. In fact, I think the first time that I released these words was back on Clubhouse. They are coming to pass now. You're, you're seeing these, right? And so pray for mercy. Pray for your leaders. We do not delight in the falling of any single person on earth because God is calling everybody. God wants all of his creation to be his sheep. We are all his prodigals, not just the ones who knew God and left. Every single creature that God has ever created and put on this earth some have been anointed and they are in places that are not yet where God needs them to be. It does not mean that they are not anointed. Think about David. Think about Joshua. Joshua was anointed, but he, he was not appointed until it was time for him to step into the, the leadership position that he needed to be in so that he could take the land. He needed to be under the, the service and the authority and the leadership, right, the stewardship of Moses so that he could do what God called him to do because the assignment was still given. It just happened to go from Moses to Joshua. And some of you are being assigned to take over something. And if the Moses is not being removed, God will remove them. Because I want you to think Moses was anointed. Moses was not able to overcome some of the things that happened in his congregation. And as a result, he faced a consequence. He was not allowed to keep going, but Joshua was, right? And so we we still honor, respect what they've done to get, because without Moses, Joshua would not have arrived, right? But at the same time, The strength of the body of Christ requires all of us to work together. And so we do not celebrate the falling of any of God's anointed people, whether or not they know God or otherwise. 
Does this make sense? Okay. We need so oh, I don't know. So some of us are watchmen on the wall. Some of the watchmen have fallen asleep. If you know a watchman, meaning you know that there's somebody who used to be like a crier, like a town crier, like back in the old days, they'd be like, like extra, extra, like hear all about it. Like the, the one that would spread the news, the, the person who would be like, oh, there's something going on. And they would start the prayer circles or the trains of, of information, whoever that is in your family, like whoever that is in your churches, whoever that is in your communities. And you've noticed like they've, fall, they've, they've fallen behind. They just, they're not doing that anymore. I want this. I don't know who this is for. You need to check up on your people and just ask, is everything okay? Lift them up in prayer, cover them with the blood of Jesus because they're weary and they cannot get weary and well-doing because they are required. Every single person who has eyes to see and ears to hear need to stand guard because without it, the taking of the land, the possessing the territory, the, the, the occupation of the land of milk and honey for all of us and what we're called to do, it will not happen the same way that it, it is in God's book. Does this make sense? Right? They, they, we all need to operate in one accord, like one body. This is why by the time they got to Joshua, that spirit of rebellion, the spirit of fear, the confusion, the poverty, the, the slave mentality had been worked out of them 40 years worth, right? That was a strategy of the Lord. Now, ours does not need to take 40 years, but it does mean that you have to be willing to lay it down before God. God, where are my idols, right? Because remember, through that whole journey, they still had idolatry. They had lots and lots of idolatry. And so that also grieved the Lord. In order for you to take your land, you have to be willing to let go of your lowercase g gods, your small gods, the things that prevent you from hearing God clearly, the things that prevent you from actually sitting and reading his word every day, the things that prevent you from sitting at God's feet like a Mary so that you can actually hear God's voice without hearing Netflix, Amazon, Spotify, YouTube, even, you know, just filling your head with all of these other prophetic voices. Prophetic voices and prophetic words, you are a prophet to your own life. Who is that for? You are a prophet to your own life. And so if you're profit chasing, meaning you're chasing after confirmation, after confirmation, after confirmation, or word after word after word after word, that could be your idol. Those giants will fall. Those giants will fall in the mighty name of Jesus. Because when Joshua then gave the command of a supernatural strategy to take the, the, the land of Jericho, like that was a crazy strategy. Nobody had done that before. And they didn't say a peep. Nothing. They didn't go, you crazy man. No, they didn't. They're like, okay, let's go. Let's do it. And they followed it to the letter of the law. Because remember back then they were under the law. So when the, the Lord said, follow my commandments, they followed his commandments because that was the requirement. That was the condition. That was the condition that the Lord gave to Joshua. That uh, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So essentially saying, if you'll listen to everything that I tell you to do, then it's all going to work out in your favor. We're in that season. Now, we are not operating under the law. This is not from a place of legalism, meaning like, um, uh, like, a spirit of religion, meaning like God is not going to punish you if you get it wrong. So I don't want you to have a fear that, oh, what if I get it wrong? What if I don't, what if I mess up? It, it's okay. You're, God expects us 
to, right? He's okay with that. That's why we have repentance. Thank God, right? His grace, his mercy, his favor. He accounts for our humanness. He loves us in spite of our humanness. Um, but what we, those are dogs. One of them might be my dog. One of them might be my kid. So I apologize in case you think that it sounds like a, a dying cat. It's not. <laughs> no cats have been harmed in the making of this video. Okay. I'm trying to find where, oh, here. This strategy. Because remember what we just walked through. That it wasn't that long ago, right? where every time Moses would say something, the children of Israel would be like, uh, uh, all the whinging and the whining and the grumbling and the complaining and the murmuring. It's why Moses didn't get to pass. So 40 years later, we have a whole different generation. <laughs> 40 years later, we have a fresh set of eyes. 40 years later, we have renewed hearts, right? 40 years later, we have children of Israel who are on fire for the Lord, who have a holy fear and awe and reverence for what the Lord says, thus saith the Lord, that are willing to obey even in the face of like a crazy pants strategy. That is supernatural favor. That is blessing. That is exceedingly abundantly more, right? And because they followed it, they were able to receive blessings. Now, I don't remember because like the Holy Spirit is, is mentioning to me that they may have not, uh, they may not have been obedient uh, with like trying to keep a piece of, because remember in Jericho, they were told, burn it all down. Right, burn it all down. And can somebody remind me? Did somebody keep something and then they and the Lord got mad and like tried to smite somebody? Yes. Here. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In what in Joshua 7 and 10. Joshua must deal with sin in the camp. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Where, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and disassembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed, meaning they were cursed, right? Neither will I be with you anymore except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. So what this is telling us, why is this important? Why did the Holy Spirit just bring this up? Because just because you take the territory and the land doesn't mean we get to go willy nilly and do whatever we want. There are very specific instructions that the Lord is giving you right now now and some of it is not going to sound right meaning people are going to come to you remember these these are all family right the children of israel they're all related and they they were more than happy to go along with it until until they saw what was in the promised land and the lord told them don't take any of it you cannot take any of it and if you if you listen, I will give you not just one city, but all of them. They will all fall before us. So you get all of it, right? So in theory, before they got in, they were okay to follow because they didn't know what they didn't know. They didn't know what, what was waiting for them. But imagine they've just been wandering for 40 years. They don't have anything left. All of the money, all of the riches, right? Like eh. they've been living on manna. And a bunch of quail. And that was because they complained. Right? Everything was provided to them by the Lord. This was an Eden season. Like the Garden of Eden. This was abundance. 
but they didn't see it as abundance. They saw it as punishment. Hmm, who is that for? When the Lord provides for us, do we see it as the Garden of Eden? Or are we seeing it as punishment like the children of Israel did? Because how you see things is going to influence how you walk with God. Hmm. So if you come across something, let's say right now you're just barely scraping by. Or let's say that that you're and barely scraping by. I don't mean like poverty. Sometimes there's some people you you're living life high on the hog, but you're barely able to pay all of your bills. I mean, you're living life good, but it's all bills. You know what I mean? I've had clients like this where they're making six figures, seven figures, sometimes more, and they're still living paycheck to paycheck. And then you see what it's like to have more, to have extra, extra. And then you realize Look at all that I've been missing. Here's what's available. And that's what happened, right? They were wandering in the wilderness. And God said, go and take this. You get rid of everything. You can't touch anything. And somebody disobeyed. They're like, well, God's not going to notice if I just take this one thing. God's not going to notice if I don't do it all the way. Uh, Yeah, he does there's consequences, right? Every parent knows that when you tell your kid, don't do this, and they do it, even if you're not there, right? Like, even if you're not there and they disobey you, there are consequences to their actions, right? You're going to find out anyways, even if you're not there. You don't need to be omniscient like God to do that. There was a curse on this object. If you go in and God tells you not to do something, this is for somebody right now. You may have come across a cursed object. You may have already started to cross into your land of milk and honey. You may have already taken your Jericho. But somebody in your camp, it may not have been you, but it could be, there's, hmm, Somebody in your camp who has taken an accursed object. Come back here, right? In verse, uh, in verse eleven, Israel has Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant. Meaning, you basically you broke my agreement. I told you to do this, and you didn't. You transgressed my covenant. Now, the Lord is a covenant-keeping God, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and disassembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. So they took the thing and tried to kind of hide it or blend it in with their own stuff. That thing is still cursed. And because of it, God says, neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you. So whatever you took, you better destroy it. It's not even, you know, put it back. Destroy the thing. If you have an accursed object in your belongings that somebody in your camp has taken that is not meant for you, you best ask the Holy Spirit. Whoever this is for, the Holy Spirit is already alerting your spirit and saying, here it is. You need to ask. You need to ask for that revelation. You need to ask for that wisdom. You need to ask for it to be shown to you and you must destroy it. Ideally by fire, do not give it away because once an object is cursed, it is cursed. Okay? Like, it doesn't matter how much it was worth. These were gold objects. These were precious things. And the Lord said, destroy it. That's why they were tempted. That's why when they saw, like, wait, God wants us to get rid of that? We can't do that. What did God say? 
And when God says no, he means no. And when we disobey, when we disobey, there is no amount of sacrifice that will overtake disobedience. It is better to obey than to try and give a sacrifice because the sacrifice won't, won't meet what's required. I mean, I want you to think Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. He wiped away everything. And yet there are times where in order for us to reverse what's been done, just repenting and pleading the blood of Jesus, does it justify our sin? Yes, but it doesn't remove the accursed object. Does this make sense? I don't know who this is for, and I will tell you personally, I have had accursed objects in my house. It creates havoc. Like, you'll know. Your spirit is disrupted. Your children might act up. Your pets might act up. Things don't work right. Uh, you don't get peace. You might not sleep properly. There's arguments. There's weird noises or sounds or sometimes smells. That you'll get weird visions. You'll get darkness, right? There'll be like dark spots. Um, weird things will happen and you'll be like, I don't get it. You'll be binding, loosing, and it's not like, and you'll, it's almost like it doesn't work. Nothing's working. You'll be going up to destroy demonic uh, altars, uh, going against and, and coming out of agreements with demonic agreements or evil agreements and covenants. Uh, you'll be going into the courts of heaven and It's right there in God's word. And it may, it may be somebody in your family, like down the line, up the line. Does this make sense? Jesus. Because it says right here in verse 13, up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. Oh my God. So then let's jump to verse 15 in Joshua. Uh, this is Joshua 7 and 15. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. He and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. Now, thankfully, God is not requiring us to go into the fire. Okay, like that's, we are not required to die by fire. The blood of Jesus washes away our sin. But the accursed thing must be destroyed. Okay, that's what this word is saying. That the accursed thing has a curse on it that does not come from the Lord. And because there's a he he will um I don't know how how it takes this. God is a covenant keeping God. If there has been a covenant made with an object that belongs to the devil, then God will that's the covenant, right? So that's the covenant. It has to be destroyed. That's the only way. That's what his word is telling us. Some of you, and so this is a warning, right? So there's supernatural strategy involved when we cross over from wilderness into milk and honey to take the land. God is going to give you the supernatural strategies and the blueprint. Some of you have been downloaded. Mm, thank you, Jesus. I just saw again. Every single time that I've been coming on here, the Lord keeps showing me keys. Now, here's what I know. You are a key. You are the key of David because Jesus is the key of David. So Jesus, as the key of David, was a prophet, a king, and a priest. Each one of these different facets is required for this next season, right? Being a priest, ministering to the Lord, being a prophet, being able to prophesy into your future, and being a, a king, which is using your authority that, that Jesus Christ gave us, the power, the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus.
So the key of David, you are the key of David by virtue of the vine, because we are grafted into the vine, right? So if you come through Jesus, then you are also part of the key of David by faith. You, remember, we take all of this by faith. We're saved by faith. So if you believe by faith in this, the Lord right now is giving more keys, more strategies, more blueprints, more downloads. He's giving divine intel. He's giving divine supernatural grace and favor and speed and acceleration. He is opening up. Oh my God. Thank you, Jesus. He is opening up doorways. He is opening up gates. He's, you are the key. You are the key. So you have to be able to be led by faith, be led by faith. Now you can be led astray. So don't, don't think that just because you're led, because Caleb and the spies were led by spirits. It, it literally says in Numbers 14, go and read it, right? I, I already read it. You go and rewatch this, go and read it too. It says that Caleb was led by another spirit. So that tells us that there were spirits there present with Caleb and with those that gave the evil report. So just because you say I'm led doesn't mean that you're being led by the spirit of God. Make sure that you're being led by the Holy Spirit in order to move through this season because it must be discerned. And if you are not sensitive to the leanings of the Holy Spirit, you will be led astray. So you must constantly retune your ear. And that's why David was a worshiper. David was a worshiper because he would be tuning his ear to the voice of the Lord, right? That's why he had the heart of God. The heart of God is where our mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, but it's also where our mind is said to dwell. Our mind and our heart are connected. So when we don't hear clearly, it is because our mind does not have the mind of Christ and we do not have the heart of the Lord within us. We are not thinking in accordance with God's heart, with God's character. We are not using our priestly authority, our kingdom authority, kingly authority, and we are not seeing as a prophet of the Lord over all, our own life. Ooh, who is that for? So. Remember Psalm 24, who is this king of glory, the Lord, um, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord of hosts, the king of glory. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, lift up you everlasting doors, because the king of glory comes in, right? The king of glory lives within us, but only when we think like God, when we see like God. And we can only do that when we spend time with the Lord and we understand who he is. When we know who God is, we understand who we are in God because we are created in his image. And it is from that place that we take the territory. It is from that place that we create our future, which is now. It is from that place that we get to see what God sees and to speak what he tells it, us to say, right? And then it's from that place that we actually get to create our dream, our vision, and make that into a reality. Ooh, Jesus, my God. I can't even make this stuff up. So, so two things here that I want to pause. This is blessing me. Number one, if you need help in speaking out loud what God is, is sharing with you, or you're not sure, like you're not clear, hmm, how do I explain this? Holy Spirit, help me. So, so I created a program with the Lord called Speak It, Say It, See It. Basically helping you to speak what God says. Say what God sees until you see it done on earth. That program last year, some of you need, I don't know who this is for. I think it's $99. It's inside of the When She Conquers community. If you need that, please send me a message. If you're on, on uh, YouTube, you can send me an email, info at susanmcvay.com. 
Um, and I will give you the link so that you can grab access to that. If you're all over on Instagram or Facebook, just send me a message with um, speak it and I'll know to share you the link. The other part is, and the devil is a liar because I've been trying to upload a bonus video into Create Your Reality for days now. And it's it's on it's on my phone. Um, the file's not even that big, it just keeps failing. So create your reality is all about a simple three-step process in how I went from bedridden to basically living the life that God dreamed for me here on earth um, in less than two years, but then kept walking in faith. And this is a journey. It's, it's the process that I follow now. So if you want access to that, it's $37. That price is going up by the end of this month to $77. Um, if you want access to that, send me a message with the word of real, R-E-A-L, okay? Because somebody on here is going to need that, whether you're on here live or on the replay. There's not a ton of information. I will be perfectly real with you. Uh, these were led by the Lord. And there's not tons of information. If it's not right for you, it's not right for you, and I'm okay. But if you, almost every single person that has joined either one of these programs, they are led by the Spirit. That's how I do business right now. Some of you are needing to see this example, because I had no, no plan to include this. The Holy Spirit, through the words that I just said out loud, I was like, oh, that's funny. These are connected to the, these two programs. And he's like, I know, I know. So somebody on here needs these. I said, okay, no problem. I am acting by faith, not fully understanding why I need to share this, but I'm doing it anyways. And I need you to know that anytime that I come on here, it's not because I am different from you. We are all one body in Christ. Right? Like if you are a follower of Jesus, and even if you are not a follower yet, uh, when we operate in accordance with God's plans and his purpose, we are one body. And that means that what I can do, because God is not a respecter of persons, you can do. And when we walk by faith, not by sight, not knowing what's on the other side, because that's what Joshua did. When he was given this supernatural strategy, he didn't know what was on the other side, but he did it anyways. When I come on here and I put on, like Monique was on here earlier, I don't know if she's still on here, and she said, oh, I was just led to study um, Joshua. She said, oh my God, I started studying Joshua today. And it's, right? I could have very well been very aggrieved or aggravated and just agitated I could have started complaining and murmuring myself that the original plan of doing part two for Esther Take the Scepter, I couldn't do it on the channel that I needed to do it on, which side note, it's going to be next week, possibly earlier if the Lord tells me, like do it before Friday, on my new YouTube channel, Knowing God's Voice. Okay, I will do it here on Instagram, on my personal Instagram as well. But that replay won't be left up on Instagram. The replay will only be on YouTube. So I'll do it live. And then the replay will be left up only on YouTube. Nowhere else. Why? Because God said. Now, if I was in my, if, if, if I was in my Susan self, I would be all worked up because what I planned, what I thought, I mean, it's late on Friday. I was delayed with just life today um, and knowing that it was already getting late by the time I realized oh I can't do this I could have been murmuring and complaining but I remembered that's what stopped the children of Israel from getting into their promised land and as I sat here and I just asked the Lord Lord I know you want me to go live I want to go live because I enjoy this it lifts me up 
it fills my spirit. It really soothes my soul. Um, what do you want me to say? What would you have me share? And so this is the one that he told me, take the land based off of a revelation that he gave me this morning that I was still mulling over. And part of me thought, I don't know if that's fully formed yet. I don't know if this is all of it yet. It doesn't matter, right? That's what I mean by taking the land. Like this is a situation of walk by faith and also walk by the spirit, not by the flesh. And that means that Moment by moment, you are going to be led by the Lord, but only if you are submitted, only if you are surrendered, only if you are discerning what the Spirit of God is showing you and telling you. And if you allow yourself, like your, your, your flesh self, your human self, to talk you out of the things that you're discerning, if you allow your family, your friends, your colleagues, whoever, right? You're like the children of Israel. They talked them out of their inheritance the first time they went around. So they had to wait 40 years in order for it to be worked out of their whole family line. That was a generational pattern that God needed to die off. He couldn't allow it to continue into the next generation. And yet the flesh of them the flesh of them immediately sinned, immediately sinned. So what that tells me is that as much as we want to think that we're prepared, as much as we've been processed in the wilderness, right? As much as we take out the, the plank in our own eye, as Jesus says, that there is still no running away from our humanity and that we don't know what we don't know yet. And so we must be able to have the humbleness of Lord, you're going to teach me. And if you're putting people like Joshua, right? Like Joshua was a leader for the children of Israel. Whoever is your Joshua for you, maybe your Joshua is you. Whatever that looks like, that we are still humble enough to know that God is the one who's God, not us. We have God in us for sure that we are created in the image of the Lord, but we are not God. We do not change heaven and earth, right? We bring heaven down to earth because we live on earth as men, as women, as children here on the earthly dimension, just as Jesus did when he walked on the earth. That is the opportunity that we have. So we are the manifest glory of the Lord. That when we create things out of supernatural strategy and supernatural obedience, then the world stands up. The world pays attention. The world comes, draws closer to us because we are the example of God on earth. Does this make sense? That's how we bring souls into the kingdom of God. By showing how good is our God. Right? Like, I just hear that sound, how good is our God? Right? Like, that's what we want to be able to say. Not because we've created fear and control and, you know, the, the rampant, like, you're going to die and go to hell, so you want to follow God. Who wants that? Like, you want to follow God because when you do, you get access to the milk and honey. Like, you just have to say, lift up your gates. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up you everlasting doors. The king of glory is coming in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, right? God is coming in with his angel armies. And every one of his forces are backing you. Imagine. I want you to take some time tonight, right? And if, you're, if this is already, you're already flipping through into the next morning, I want you to take some time in the morning, whatever is your day, that you sit with the Lord, that you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you and take some time to journal on this, right? Like really meditate on this. Who are you according to God? Because when you have your identity fixed firmly in Christ, 
There is no way that you can lose. That's why Joshua was able to take the land. Because God said, be strong and of good courage. Because that's who Joshua was. Right? That's why they won. It was already done in the spirit. But God needed an ambassador on earth that could carry out his work. And so Joshua was the one that stood for God. Will you stand for God? Will you stand for God wherever he has appointed and anointed you? That wherever your feet would tread, that that is the land that God has reserved for you. That is your inheritance for you to take because Jesus already paid the price. His blood shed already paid the price. That it is now just a matter of you remembering who you are in Christ to say, I'm going to take this. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes, no matter how crazy it sounds or how crazy it looks, because we don't walk by sight and actually mean it. This is not paying lip service to a bunch of words on a page that was written thousands of years ago. This is about you truly believing in your heart, right? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, that your heart believes God. Right? Does it make sense? I almost went up my nose. Excuse me. So, get ready. Because the warfare that happened in the wilderness was part of the process. Just like Holy Spirit alerted us. When we cross over into Jericho, there will be strict instructions. Right? We, we must obey what God says because, again, not all of it's going to make sense. It didn't make sense to destroy everything until they found out some of those objects were cursed. They're demonic. They're laced with witchcraft, right? They have had demonic decrees spoken over them. You do not want to just take any old thing and bring it into your home. You do not want to take any old thing and bring it into your mind. You don't want to bring any old thing and start speaking it out loud. That's what God is saying. Do not do that. Because then all of that work will be for nothing. Because he could not help them. They brought that cursed object into their own stuff. Like it literally says, into your own stuff. And because of that, you cannot stand against your enemies. That's a battle you can't fight. Because you're, it's an automatic L. Right? It's an automatic L. So if you are struggling, because some of you have already taken the land. And you've already started moving forward. And you're like, I don't know if it doesn't feel like I've actually moved into the promised land. Why? I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, is there an accursed object? Has somebody in my camp sinned? Because that, that's what happened, right? They, there was sin. We have to repent for the sin. And then we have to remove the cursed object and destroy it. So you have to find it so that you can destroy it. So we must ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, is there an accursed object in my camp? Is there an accursed object in my home? Is there an accursed object in my workplace? Is there an accursed object in my ministry? Is there an accursed object in the church that I, I go to? Is there an accursed object in my territory? Is there an accursed object in my community? Because some of you, some of us are called to the land upon which we stand. Like, I want you to literally think what Joshua did. He was called to a land. Some of you right now, because you're, you're, you're connected to me, you're assigned to me. So I know, thank you, Holy Spirit, for this. Some of you are, has anybody been moved? Like you literally have moved from one place to another place or you're in the process of moving, 
from one location to another location, the Lord is doing this intentionally. Okay. Because remember what the word says. Oh, goodness. I closed it thinking we we're done. Silly Susan. In Joshua, it says here about his feet. Joshua 1 and 3. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. So some of us, we have literally been given a, a place that we are declaring for the Lord. And that this is for somebody right now. That's why the warfare has been so severe is because even though the place where you live, you reside, where your feet literally tread, like every place of the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. It may not be part and parcel of what the, like the work that you're doing in the land, but the, the sheer fact that you are in that territory means that there is part of you, part of you that is assigned to break something from the land, like the physical earth itself. Because remember the first commandment that the Lord gave to us as human beings, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth and have dominion. So you are being called to subdue the earth and have dominion because without what you carry, what, without what you carry, the land itself cannot be fruitful and multiply. The people that live there cannot be fruitful and multiply. The Lord is using you to break off something in the land by which you reside. And if you have been moved from one place to another, it is because of what you carry. Does this make sense? I hope, I hope this is helping somebody. Because you may be wondering, what's going on? It feels like it's not working. Uh, and and you can sense that it's related to the earth, like the dirt itself. The earth is crying out. Like the scripture says, the blood of Abel cries out from the from the earth. The Lord said, I can hear the blood. I can hear the blood. Well, you're coming in to plead the blood of Jesus to overtake the blood that's in the land that's crying out, that's asking for like payment. It's saying, pay me, like feed me, feed me. And the Lord is saying, you're there as a watchman of sorts in order to, to declare the works of the Lord to appease the earth because you are subduing the earth who is for my god thank you jesus you are here to be fruitful to be multiplying to bless the earth right you are the blessing for the earth you are there to subdue and to have dominion through the blood of jesus there is something about you and the weight the words of your the weight of your words so when you, so so some of you are you're already doing this you're going around and you're doing like a prayer circle. You are wandering around your neighborhood. You are wandering around your church buildings. You are wandering around your workplaces. You are wandering around your 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 nurseries, your daycare centers. Um, the, there's certain buildings, your municipal buildings. The Lord has assigned you to certain areas and certain locations that you are carrying forth, thus saith the Lord. And as you go out and you pray and you prophesy and you declare and decree, and you're doing this, whether you're praying in tongues sometimes you're praying like under your breath you are trying not to cause a ruckus but some of you are doing it really loud and i'm telling you right now that that is all on assignment that is the lord speaking through you that there is a grace that there is an anointing there is a fresh outpouring of oil thank you jesus thank you holy spirit that as you declare the words of the lord that you are literally shaking and breaking and taking and making and causing the heavens to fall down to earth that there is a a holy heaven my god there's a holy 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 reverence and awe for the lord that is coming upon the places where your feet would tread that the soles of your feet are highly blessed anointed and favored that just as joshua would take the territory so are you doing thus saith the lord my god thank you jesus that you are finishing whatever was started but could not be completed because Whoever was there before 
fell off the post, was allowing wickedness and sin and idolatry, that they would allow the people that were under them to sin, to complain, to murmur, to forget what the Lord did. And by virtue of you being there, that you are bringing forth, I hear behold, I am doing a new thing. Do you not see it? That there are rivers now being placed in places where there were waste, where there were uh, deserts, that there are now bubbling springs of everlasting waters, that the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord is coming and bringing fruitfulness. My God, thank you, Jesus. Whew, my God. Very dizzy. Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hello, Joshua. I don't know who that was for. I think that was for a lot of people. Because I just saw like a literal army, an army of people walking the earth on behalf of the Lord to declare and decree that this land belongs to God. And that even if you are doing things, like if you are called to the nations, if you are doing like this, right? Like you, you don't necessarily have to have your feet literally touching earth upon earth upon earth upon earth. You may be going out just like I'm doing right now and reaching the nations, right? Like I have a podcast called Master the Sales Game. I haven't produced a brand new episode for years now, I think, at least two years. And we're somehow still topping the charts in Laos. That's in Asia. Like there's people listening to me in Asia. There's people who've messaged me from like uh, Europe, from Russia, from Ukraine, um, from Africa, like Nigeria, like, the Philippines, Japan, all over the world. This could be you too, right? Just open your mouth, declare whatever the Lord is putting on your heart. You're going to know, you're going to know whatever it is that the Lord is asking you to do. But I saw very clearly, I saw it very clearly, oh my God, there is a weight W-E-I-G-H-T, like a heaviness to the thing that you carry. Just like Joshua, there was a weight to Joshua's assignment because he had been processed for 40 years and his faithfulness was rewarded. Without it, history would look very different. Not just like natural history, but spiritual history. This is our lineage that we're, we're birthed into. This is the lineage of Jesus. It is very important that we understand where we come from, not because we're under the law, right? Jesus broke the law with the blood, but because it sets the foundation and, and it helps us to understand what was old so what is new can be appreciated. Okay? Because what's new points to and fulfills what was old. And what was old is constantly pointing to the new, which is Jesus. And so if we don't remember where we came from, we can't appreciate where we're going and where we are right now. And so the book of Joshua right now and taking this land I asked the Lord, I was like, is this a prophetic word? Are they all, pro I mean, they're all prophetic words. This, this, we're prophesying to our own life, right? If this is for you, you will know. Go before the Lord. You're probably going to need to re-listen to this a few times, right? So I would recommend that you re-watch this on YouTube. It's going to be the easiest place because you can stop, start, meditate, read the word. Ask the Holy Spirit and then come back to the spot where you were. That's just me personally. Okay? But you do you. You're going to want to go before the Lord and ask the Lord, along with Holy Spirit, what do I do with this? What is the strategy? How does this apply to me? 
when I work with clients, these are the things that we work out together, right? Now, if you're going to join uh, Create Your Reality, Write It Real, or Speak It, Say It, See It, there are specific strategies, teachings, and practical, tactical like wisdom on how to apply certain things that are biblically based. So either one of those programs, feel free to take them, feel free not to take them. No harm, no foul off my back. I already live it. I already have my fruit. <laughs> so it's fine. But what I would suggest that the number one thing that you get into the practice of is always asking God, God, what did you say? And if you don't know, the verse that you want to declare over yourself is I hear my father's voice and I do not follow the voice of another, right? I might be paraphrasing, like you don't hear the voice of a stranger. You hear God's voice. And if you don't know what God's voice sounds like, I want you to start reading it. I've given you several scriptures. So let's recap. And then we're going to pray out. Number one, Exodus chapter three. We read specifically from verse six to 15. Okay, Exodus three, six and 15. We read numbers 13 through 14. I want you to read all of it. It's not very long. We read selected passages here. Then we want to read Joshua 1, verses 1 through 9, okay? But if you're being called as a Joshua, as an example, I would highly recommend that you start reading through the book of Joshua, starting from verse, like book 1, like chapter 1 and continuing through. It's not very long. It won't take you, it, it'll take you less than, uh, listen, it's shorter than watching Bridgerton. Again, honestly, right? If you have time to watch Bridgerton, you have time to watch Joshua or read Joshua. Just saying. So that's what I would recommend that you do because you are strong. You are of good courage. The exercise that we want to all do is to ask God, God, who did you create me to be in Christ? Who am I in Christ? Because you want to create alignment between your identity and like how God created you in Christ and the work that you're meant to do for this season. Because when that happens, you're going to walk into your promised land. That's how you take the territory, right? Um, stay tuned because there, there may be more details on like an actual workshop to help you with this. But you need to do the work first. You need to ask the Lord to reveal to you who you are. And if you already know, if you've already done this, then I want you, and you don't have to answer this here, I want you to ask yourself, and you can ask God, why are you not walking out your full identity in Christ if you know who you are? Are you taking the actions necessary that demonstrate and create alignment between here's who I am and here's who I am who does what God says? Does that make sense? Because if you know who you are and yet you're not doing what you would do as who you are in Christ, there's a mismatch. There's something off, right? What is that? Is it your old identity? Right? Maybe. Is it a mentality of less than? Not deserving? Slavery? as like the children of Israel, right? Is it a spirit of grasshopper? Because there is, that is, a, like, that's a spirit. They saw themselves as little in the face of giants. You are a David. You are the key of David, just as Jesus was. 
the key of David was a giant in the face of a real giant because he had God on his back. That's who you are. Thank you. I love that stuff on Instagram, right? Stop believing the lies. So if you join late next week, so every Wednesday, I do a wealth and wisdom segment. Uh, stay tuned. So number one, if you're following my so, uh, Susan McVeigh account, uh, please feel free to subscribe, like, follow, do all the things on all the social media platforms. I generally talk about business, sales, mindset, uh, faith, okay, on my on my personal pages. Now, the Bible teachings, prophetic words, right now, the Lord is directing me to put specifically on a separate YouTube channel. I will have an, an Instagram page, um, but I will not be going live on there. That's not what God has told me to do. So it's called Knowing God's Voice. Okay. If you like this type of teaching style, then I need you to go and subscribe to that YouTube channel. Okay. Knowing God's Voice. Go and look for it. It should be somehow linked to me because I connected the two together for this particular one. Um, go and find it. Next week, we are going to go live on YouTube and on my personal Instagram, but the replay will not live on Instagram. It will only live on YouTube. And that will be on take two, part two, for Esther. Take the scepter. Okay? On my personal page, I usually go live on Wednesdays for wealth and wisdom, talking about something business, sales, money related. And stay tuned because there may be more stuff coming down. Um, because, I mean, the, the Lord is working on all of us. And I'm telling you right now, um, he needs all of us to do our part. And the more that you win in all areas of your life as a whole human, that means your health, your wealth, your relationships, your emotional, your mental, and your spiritual well-being, including your physical self, that it is all very, very important to the Lord, right? And the better that you are, the more that you make, the more that you can do for the kingdom of heaven. And he needs more people like you, like me, doing good in the world. Our children, we just talked about this. Our children depend on us. It like the things that we do here in this lifetime not only impact you, not only impact me, but they impact three to four generations down. The Bible says that uh, a wealthy, like a wise man, a wealthy man, uh, leaves an inheritance, not just for his children, but his children's children. When we read from Numbers 13 and four, like Numbers 13 through 14, the Lord said that the sins, the iniquities are visited from the forefathers onto their children, the third and fourth generation. Third and fourth generation. So if we have sins and iniquities that can visit our children's 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 children, three to four generations down the right line, and that you could be impacted from iniquities and sins from up the chain three to four generations, then surely the blessings can do the same, right? Don't you want to leave a legacy for the kingdom? Don't you want to leave a legacy for your family that there is a blessing of the Lord like Abraham, the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that God and that legacy is where Jesus came from. That God and that legacy is what impacted David where Jesus came from. That God that impacted that legacy, where Jesus came from, 
is where you and I have grafted into. That's where we've come from. Do you see where I'm going here? Jesus died so wealthy that they fought over his clothing when he died. He did not die a poor man. Don't you want to have your legacy and all the stuff that you have be of such abundance that there would be people who would be like, I want the clothes like that you, I know that sounds morbid, but I, I, I want you to just like not look at the natural part, but like understand the impact He was humble in spirit, right? We need to be humble in spirit. Rich in the Lord. But when we're rich in the Lord, he gives us everything that we need. We want for no good thing. That's what the Bible says, right? So if there is a child of God who right now is suffering because they have want for something, there is a reason for it. Because this, this is, as Pastor Kevin Ewing said, this is a rule book. And there are const we just read a whole bunch of them where it, it gives us strategy. If this, then that. If this, then that. Right? The Lord is very specific. And while it takes revelation and it takes uh, understanding of the mystery so that we can apply it to today's world in a practical way, it is not so out there that that's not possible. We need help. Thank God for the Holy Spirit, because that's who our helper is. Our comforter allows us to understand the mysteries of this book so that we can apply the word to our life. And then obviously, we have guidance, right? Some of us need guidance from human beings. We're, we're called to do life in unity in community. That's why we're designed to be married. I don't know who this is for. I'm going to really, oh, hold on. I was just praying because I needed to hear what the Lord was saying here. Um, because I thought I was going to release a blessing, but but the Lord said, no, this, I'm going to release a warning instead. Because I heard very clear, because I was about to release something. And the Lord said, no, some of you are idolizing the promise that you've been given. And until you remove that idol from your heart, you will not get what it is that God has promised. I'm going to say that again. And I say this as somebody who's been processed through this. An idol is anything, because sometimes we think an idol is like, I, you know, I'm bowing to something and I'm worshiping it. And it's like a, you know, a holier than that. No, an idol is literally anything that would get in the way of you and God. Okay, because remember that Jesus came to remove the separation. And so when the veil was torn, the veil represented the veil that, that was from the temple to the holiest of holies. There was a separation as you kept moving in the temple to go from the outer court to the inner court to the to inside and then the, the holiest of holies the holiest of holies is actually if we were to physically map it out on your body as the temple it is your head it is your mind so the veil separated from the the part of the temple just before you would go into the holiest of holies because the holiest of holies was a, a, a place of reverence and only the priests were allowed to go in there right and the glory of the Lord was just so magnificent that they actually couldn't stare upon the presence of the Lord directly. Um, it, and it's also, it's why not every person could come in. 
However, when Jesus died, that veil was ripped. So there was no separation between the everyday person that was just in the regular temple and then the priest, which you are a priest, to come into the holiest of holies. And so that separation has removed us from being out like out here, like let, let's consider your feet, right? Your feet or lower lower body as like the holiest of holies down to the temple, that the outer court is down near your feet, that you are no longer groveling at the foot of the Lord. You are able to be right there with the Lord. When you put an idol in place, it means that that thing has created separation so that that veil that Jesus did the work for to rip it apart, right? That's his body ripped apart so that we could enter into the holiest of holies that you have now put something This is between you and God. And so instead of going to God, you're checking in with your phone. Instead of going to God, you're checking in with your best friend. Instead of going to God, you're checking on uh, Instagram. Instead of going into God, you're going to, uh, you know, ask your boss everything. Instead of going into God, you're going to whatever. That idol, including the promise, which means... I want to get married, Lord. Like, and you're thinking about your future husband, your future wife, your future children, the the house that God promised you, the car that God promised you, the job that God promised you, the bank account balance that God promised you, the the place, the vacation that God promised you. Where whatever is this promise that has created now, it's an idol, and you're meditating on this. Instead of meditating on God, it's a very subtle difference, but God will not be mocked. And if you continually look upon the thing, the creation, instead of creator, right? You keep looking at the promise instead of the promisor, you will not get what it is that you desire. Because God will not get the glory. This thing will. This thing will. You will. And that's not it. It belongs to God. Does this make sense? Give up your idols. Give up your idols. Um, and if this, if that word applies to you, I'm going to recommend that you go and watch. Oh, what is that? The last covered by God from Tiffany Montgomery. Your idols will fall. Okay, your idols will fall. It's mostly worship, to be honest. And if we go back into the word and what we just read today, Caleb came from the house of Judah, the tribe of Judah. The lion of Judah is the Lord, Yahweh, Jesus, Yeshua. When we come and worship before God, you're worshiping something when you have an idol. Whatever you're spending the most time with, even if that's your husband, even if that's your children, even if that's your pain, right? Even if that's your problem, even if that's your job, do, do you have to spend a certain amount of time in a nine to five because you're getting paid? Yes. But are you meditating constantly on the issues of your job or are you inviting God to come into your place of work? It doesn't mean that you're sitting there and praying all day long or like talking about Jesus all day long. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, are you inviting God to come into your heart to guide and to lead you to shed light on the things that you need to do so that you have peace that surpasses understanding in every good work that you do, that everything that your hands touch prospers, that your feet that land on the ground, it's because that's where the Lord has appointed you to be. And so you see it from a place of heavenly places, like ascended at the right hand of the father. That's what I mean, because when you do that, there is no idol. It falls. And you have now put God back in his rightful place, which is up there and back in your heart because you are created in the image of God. We are not God, but we are created in his image. And the more that you understand the character of God, the nature of God, the more that you understand who you are in Christ Jesus. So do not idolize the promise. Do not 
from this message here, do not idolize the land, the territory, the milk and honey. What God gives, he can take away, right? And he will. You, you, you are seeing that right now by people who have placed platform, platform before presence. God desires your heart. He wants you. He wants you to know that he is still God. Make sense? Okay. I don't know why that needed to happen because only Holy Spirit knows. Um, I pray that it helps somebody who needs to be uh, correct. Like, you're so close. You're so close. And we're in, we are in an open portal, right? There is an opening right now, an open gate. I don't know how else to explain this. Like, the gates and the doors are swinging wide. And it is very important that you walk with the Lord and that you spend time with people who are on God's side. Test the fruit. Even for me, I forgot to say the, at, at the beginning of this one, um, but always test the fruit. Ask God, is she is she on the Lord's side? He'll tell you, right? Um, and for some, some seasons, you may be required to remove certain voices and certain people, and you may be, the Lord may ask you to connect with certain people. And I don't mean like in a weird way. I mean like in a kingdom way. That And it doesn't always have to be um, a kingdom person. Because I think sometimes we have a fear about being unequally yoked. If you check with the Lord. Uh, now I'm not going to tell you what to do or what not to do in terms of this. You need to ask God. Who do I need to learn from? What do I need to learn from certain people? Because just because you learn from somebody doesn't mean that you're unequally yoked. Okay. Uh, it, it, that is talking about covenant. It's talking about an agreement. It's talking about um, basically saying like, I agree with you and we're bound together. That we absolutely sh should not be doing that unequally. Uh, there are consequences. But that being said, God gives grace. God gives a lot of grace, thankfully. Okay. So do not condemn yourself. If any of this has been for you in terms of correction, God corrects because he loves us. Because he loves us. Otherwise, he'd let us just get into a mess and be totally fine with that. Remember, he's a good father. He's a good father and he wants the best for us. So let's pray. My phone's about to die. So let's Let's pray that my phone does not die mid-prayer. I think we have enough juice because we have 20%, but we'll see. So let's pray. I just heard angels singing. Thank you, Lord. So I just heard, well done. Well done, my good and loyal servant. And I know that that's for more than just me. Otherwise, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't be saying this out loud. Father, we just come before you and we just thank you for your word. Your word is always on time. Your word that comforts and lifts us up and also corrects us. And we just thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus that he did it all for us, that he He finished the work on the cross, Lord. And we know that any of our doing is not from a place of striving. It is not from a place of dead works, meaning it is not something that we strive for through our flesh, but that we are completing and being driven to do, compelled and spirit-led, convicted, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we are allowing the works of your hands to be worked through us and in us and for us and 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 by your spirit. We ask that you would continue to pour out your spirit, Lord, that we are vessels and you are the potter. 
that you are shaping and forming us and that if we have been deformed in any way, Lord, your word says in Isaiah 54 and 17 that no weapon formed against us shall prosper and every tongue that rises up against us shall be condemned. And we just condemn every tongue that is rising up against our destiny. Lord, we speak to every evil spirit that would come against our divine destiny right now. We would come against and bind and rebuke every evil spirit, every spirit of complaining or murmuring, every spirit of delay, every spirit of death or destruction. Lord, we pray against every spirit of miscarriage that would cause us to abort our destiny. Lord, we ask for every angel army to come and help us, that you would bring us destiny helpers right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, your word says in Psalm 91 that if our foot so much as dashes against a stone, that your ministering spirits would come and help us. And Lord, we just ask if there are any places where our feet are, are treading, where there are serpents or snakes that we have not taken the power and the authority over, that you would help us be strong and of good courage, just as you commanded Joshua. Let us similarly be reminded of who we are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, if there is any part of us that does not yet know who you are and who we are in you, that you would show us, that you would reveal to us, that you would allow us to understand the mysteries of who we are in you and that you would reveal to us our true identity, just like you revealed to Joshua and reminded him as he crossed into the territory of his promised land, into the milk, uh, the land of milk and honey, that as we cross over into our land, into our territories, into our assignments, into our inheritance, and we take the land that you have set aside for us, Lord, that you would remind us and show us that you have never left us, you have never forsaken us, that you are always with us, and that you would remind us when we are low, when we are weak, when we are shaken, when we are not sure, that you would allow us to rest in you, that we would draw near to you, that you would be our comfort, our shield, our joy, that we would you would allow us to use your word as a double-edged sword that would would cut away any confusion or strife or doubt, any anger, any remorse, any guilt or confusion. Lord, we just bind that now. We we ask for your balm, your balm of Gilead, that you would allow us to feel forgiveness, that any hearts that are sick, any hearts that are weary, any hearts that are saddened, any hearts that have been drained of faith because your hope has been deferred for far too long, that we would allow ourselves to receive supernatural heart surgery, Lord, and that you would come and spend time with us as we come and spend time with you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we would just repent that we have been spending so much time before other things, before things that have taken away our time or our attention. And Lord, we we just ask for your forgiveness. Let us be like Mary and not like Martha. Let us activate in our faith and still be able to do works, but not from a place of striving, not from a place of lack, not from a place of poverty, not from a place of slavery, but understanding our kingly anointing and appointing that we would take the authority that Jesus gave to us as the key of David, that we would receive that same anointing and mantle as the key of David, that every single gate and door that has been closed to us, Lord, we ask that in the mighty name of Jesus, that just like your word declared in Psalm 24, that, that we would be able to declare that every single head must be risen up, that we are coming in and on behalf of the Lord of hosts, the King of glory, the Lord of hosts, strong and mighty, that he goes before us and that he has waved his banner of victory as Jehovah Nisi and he has won every battle on our behalf. And we just thank you, Lord, that you have given us this territory. We thank you that you have given us this land. We thank you that this land of milk and honey that will surpass all understanding is right before us. Lord, let us have the strength and the faith and the conviction to do what you have asked us to do. Let us be obedient. Let us not tarry. Let us not delay. Let us not be afraid. Lord, your word says that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and strong mind. And let us come before you every single day to ask for your 
understanding, to ask for your wisdom. Your word says that when we ask, we shall receive. And we just ask you now, Lord, what is it that we need to know? What is it that we need to understand? What is it that needs to be revealed? What is it that we need to to take action upon? And Lord, if there is something that we have been remiss on, that we have failed to be obedient on, we repent now. We ask for your forgiveness. We come before you and we just thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your presence. Only you, you can do this, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Who in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. My God. Okay. With that, whew, I, I just prayed. That was longer than I was expecting. I bless you. It's late. I thank you for being on here. Um, God loves you. I love you. And more importantly, uh, Jesus did it all. With that, we will see you next time. Bye-bye.